Man, this is a weird machine. Mostly in a good way, although some of that's debatable. The spec I have is pretty weird in and of itself. Rocking a Ryzen 9 6900HX CPU with 64GB of DDR5 4800 RAM, two 2TB PCI Gen 4 SSDs in RAID 0, making for an ultra-fast 4TB drive, and an RTX 3080 Ti. This spec is eye-wateringly expensive, coming in at an insane £4,300. But before you click off, you'll be happy to know they sell a much more reasonable spec with a 6800H and a 3070 Ti instead, albeit with a pretty meagre 16 gigs of RAM, but a healthy 2TB SSD still, all for a much more reasonable 2700 that's still a lot, I know, but this is one hell of a machine, so let's take a look at how this insane spec performs. But first, a message from this video sponsor, Lexar. Their NM760 PCIe Gen 4x4 SSD is a budget-friendly drive that sports a brand new, efficient 12nm controller, up to 5.3GB per second in reads and 4.5GB per second in writes, a petabyte written rating, and a five-year warranty. The NM760 will fit in almost anything, including the PS5, so pick up yours today at the link in the description below. I feel I need to preface these results with a bit of a, a, bit of a warning. My testing on this didn't exactly go to plan. I encountered what I can only assume are numerous bugs throughout the system, but specifically for gaming, some of the games seem to be running like just absolute trash. I can't work out if it's because it's running on the iGPU instead of the 3080 Ti or what. I did play around with the uh, de uh, MUX settings and all that sort of stuff, but still couldn't work it out. And what uh, probably didn't help is that uh, my first set of results were run on the hottest day uh, recorded in British history. I did try rerunning the tests or the benchmarks on a much cooler day, but the performance I was getting was significantly worse and consistently. So I'm kind of out of time and energy to chase what's wrong with this thing. So here's the actual results. CSGO was by far the most affected title, running at around 200 FPS at 1080p on low settings, which is about as good as a 5600H uh, and a 3060 in the Acer Nitro 5. Yeah, not great. Cyberpunk, on the other hand, had the best performance I have ever seen. Over 10 FPS clear of the Zephyrus M16 in their respective turbo modes. It did have lower 1% low figures though, meaning a, a less smooth and stable experience. Watch Dogs Legion sits at a somewhat reasonable, if pretty low for this spec, 100 FPS average, pretty much in both modes, and again suffering in the 1% low figures. Fortnite is again pretty decent, second only to the M16 Turbo results, and this time records a pretty decent 1% low set. Microsoft Flights is again low for this spec, but generally decent, running a touch behind the Aero 17XE4. And lastly, in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it's again pretty chart topping performance, only behind the M16 Turbo results, and only by 2 FPS. Still hurting in the 1% low figures though. Of course, those results were at 1080p for the sake of accurate comparison, but at the native 2560x1600, the 16x10 resolution, you of course get a, a little bit less out of it. Still over 60 FPS everywhere with most titles, uh, and actually a lot of the newer titles or the, the more optimized ones pushing well past 100. Now, that's great and all, but one of the other benefits of a machine like this is for content creation too. For something like content creation, you'll be happy to know that the 6900HX is a pretty decent option. In Cinebench, it does end up running behind the 12700H and the 12900H, but in Blender, it does a great job of catching up and even overtaking all but the 135 watt peak of the 12900H in the M16 in its turbo mode. Premiere offers a pretty compelling result overall, although After Effects is strangely lagging. 
Finally, in Photoshop, it scores reasonably well, if not the highest I've seen even from a Ryzen CPU. Now we can get onto the fun bit, the display. This is a mini LED backlit, I believe IPS style LCD panel, that can hit as high as 1100 nits and has 512 zone local dimming, making for a rather impressive viewing experience. It came out of the box calibrated with a Dell CE of under 2, which is great, and even has closing on 100% coverage of the DCI-P3 spectrum, which all converts into a rather excellent viewing experience. The colors really pop, even with the measured SDR brightness at just shy of 700 nits, it's still a vibrant, rich look that genuinely makes the best of whatever content or games you happen to be viewing. For content creation, this is a great panel as well. Like I said, the accuracy is excellent, the color gamut coverage is great, and the brightness even makes for decent enough HDR, both creation and consumption. The local dimming can be a bit of an issue, as with uh, even with 512 zones on a relatively small display, you can still see haloing around light objects on dark backgrounds. Although, ASUS seems to be doing some trickery here, where on small objects, like your mouse cursor, when over completely dark backgrounds, it keeps the brightness as low as possible to reduce how visible that haloing is. And if I'm being honest, I had no problems with the local dimming when in actual use. Sure, it technically isn't perfect, but I think it's good enough for you to not notice those technical limitations. As for the response times, ASUS claims this panel has a 3 millisecond or less response time, and with the overdrive setting in ASUS Armory Crate enabled, the high speed footage I captured would generally agree. Being pedantic, it might be more like 5 or 6 milliseconds all in, but it is well within the refresh rate window, which is great. But what happens if I change the shutter speed on my camera down to 1 10,000th of a second instead? Oh, it's flickering like mad. My estimates put this at pulsing the backlight on and off every around 20 microseconds or around 50,000 hertz. While I don't really like PWM backlights, 50 kilohertz is a pretty decent frequency for that to run at. Sadly, I can't get any usable measurements from my OSR TT unit as, well, this is what the data looks like. My smoothing function works remarkably well here to generate some level of usable data, but it's just far, far too noisy to get anything good from. Some rare transitions mostly work out so that you can get a somewhat clear around 4 millisecond results, but others are just too noisy and end up reporting more like 60 milliseconds, which we can see from the high speed footage just isn't the case. When not hampered by poor game performance, the gaming experience is pretty great. The screen feels snappy and decently smooth, and of course, remarkably crisp for being a 1600p display and a 16 inch form factor. When it comes to the screen pad, the obvious benefit of having a second display is that whether you're gaming and you want to have you know, Discord or your stream and chat open, or you're editing videos, you can make use of that extra screen real estate for uh, say a smoother editing experience, maybe stick your timeline down there, or even in theory anyway, use ASUS's Dials software to be able to easily control and edit stuff like that. That is uh, an obvious benefit. Although I would add, ASUS has actually redesigned the hinge again for the, the screen pad so that it not only lifts up to give more airflow into the fans below it, but it actually moves closer to the main display as well, revealing a small panel with uh, slight sort of transparent sort of circuit board logos, because that's apparently a thing ASUS likes to do now. Uh, and generally speaking, it's a pretty decent design. The fact that it lifts up means that you get more airflow in, and actually, like I said, with this new design you get even more airflow in there as well. And the screen pad itself is a very nice addition. You can also disable the keyboard and trackpad for a decent drawing experience. The matte finish on it makes it good for drawing, but not so good for actively looking at. There's definitely a disparity between the brightness and general viewing experience viewing something on the screen pad versus the, the full main display. 
uh, with the screen pad's brightness going up to around 500 nits, compared to, like I said, at least in sort of HDR content, more like a thousand nits or more on the main display. So can be a bit jarring. IO-wise, uh, you wouldn't say that this was absolutely jam-packed. You get two USB-A ports, one on the back and one on the left, which if you happen to use the right angle charger facing forwards, it just tries to snap your USB cables but just constantly, which is a, a great design. Uh, on top of that, uh, on top of the, the Type-A ports, you get two Type-C ports, I think both with DisplayPort Alt Mode outs, uh, HDMI, a microSD card reader, RJ45 Ethernet, a headphone jack, and of course the DC in. Battery-wise, you get a 90 watt hour unit, which isn't too bad, although with the mini LED backlight and a second display, the battery life here isn't exactly mind-blowing. So, for £4,300, or the more reasonable 2700 is it worth picking this thing up? Well, my experiences with it actually somewhat lead me away from saying yes. The mix of bugs, both performance and things like the touchscreen glitching out, the ASUS Dell software incredibly inconsistently just not launching, and plenty of other just little things ended up making it an almost frustrating experience for me to use. The 3080 Ti seems like an utterly pointless choice, as even when it was on form, I was still getting less performance than a 3070 Ti, for well over a thousand pounds more cash. I still do like their concept of the, the dual screen design, although I'm still not quite sure how practical it really is. Having the keyboard this close to the edge and a touchpad crushed into an admittedly somewhat ergonomic small corner just doesn't seem great unless you can use this on a desk 24-7, in which case why not just get a desktop instead? The massive Power brick definitely hampers portability too, so I'm just not sure. It's definitely not bad, and I think if you end up with one of these, any spec at all, I think you're going to have a pretty decent type. But this model, at least, just isn't screaming amazing to me. With that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the Zephyrus Geo 16? Is it a machine you pick up yourself? Maybe the slightly uh, lower end model with a slightly more reasonable spec? Or would you go with something else instead? Maybe a more conventional style that doesn't have the second screen? Maybe something with an Intel CPU or an AMD GPU? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below or actually maybe even a desktop instead. Uh, if you want to check the uh, Zephyrus Geo 16 out, I'll leave a global Amazon affiliate link to it in the description if you do want to check it out. And if you want to see more videos from me, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. Check out plenty of other reviews on the end cards. And there, of course, uh, you can support the channel through YouTube itself and become a YouTube member or get some cool rewards of doing so, or Patreon instead if you'd rather. Pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or use some of the affiliate links in the description for places like Oprah UK if you're buying from there. All of those things massively help out. And otherwise, that's kind of it. Hope you enjoy the video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.